talks about 18, 1840 to 1844, the Three Angels Messages. And last night we spent some time in the uh, Declaration of Independence and uh, touched on some of the others, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and then the First Angels Message, well, actually the Third Angels Message, and we'll continue with that tonight also. Uh, we looked, last night we saw the relationship that the United States was raised up by God to, uh, for this message that would go to the world. It's the only place it could have been and uh, have gone forth as it has here. Uh, and God has given you and me the privilege of being a part of the last day movement. And we looked at Revelation 14, 12. We spent quite a lot of time in that. Well, actually, the whole, the whole time. But let's read it again. And then we're going to go, uh, go to Romans 3 again that we read last night. Uh, in chapter, 12, uh, chapter 14, in verse 12 of Revelation. Um, you know it by heart, I'm sure. That here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We talked about how he was thinking they, they gave you the conclusion before they give you the premise. And so, in, to understand this, first we must keep the faith of Jesus, then we will obey the commandments, then patience is the result of that activity. And uh, we looked at Romans uh, chapter 3, and then we'll go back there again also, and uh, refresh our memories, and then take another step in this, in Romans 3. Romans 3, verses uh, 21 and 22, it says that now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is through, and the old King James says, through the faith of Jesus, to all, upon all those who believe. And, uh, but the law, although we cannot get righteousness from the law, we can only get it from Christ. But if we have a genuine article, it will be brought into harmony with God's law. And the law then testifies in the heavenly courts for us, as a witness in our behalf, that we have the genuine article, if it's by faith in Christ that we're all. And now I want to drop down now the last verse in the chapter, verse 31. And he says, Do we make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. And so the faith that we have in Christ, but the faith of Jesus always establishes the law of God. And uh, we spoke last night about some who, who uh, try to separate justification by faith and obedience to God's law. But there's a loving obedience that comes, appreciation for what God has done for us. Amen. And we want to keep His law. Not as a legalistic maneuver to get into heaven, but because we love Him. And we talked about how um, the law deals with our supreme love to God, and then our impartial love to other people, and even love to our enemies. And I think I mentioned we had a slide on here that says that, that uh, we even love those who try to do us in. <laughs> and in the last days, this is going to be, I think, a factor. But God will give us that grace uh, if, we, if we respond to Him. Uh, E.J. Wagner had this to say about uh, verse 31 and, and justification. Justification carries the law on the face of it. In other words, it's, it's right up front. That's what you see. Uh, the only uh, danger is in not getting it. It establishes the law of God in the heart. This is the purpose of justification by faith, to establish God's law there. So it's immovable. Now, we also consider <clears throat> Psalm 119, 172, all of your commandments are righteousness. Now, if all of them are righteousness, is the Sabbath also righteousness? Amen. So if the Sabbath, or if the law of God testifies to the genuine article of righteousness, does the Sabbath do the same thing? Amen. Does the Sabbath testify for us as the law of God, as a part of the law of God? Amen. Absolutely. Verse 21 of uh, uh, Romans 3, that, that uh, the law is a witness in our behalf. And that includes the Sabbath. The Sabbath is one of the greatest uh, 
proofs of justification by faith in Christ the Lord. It is a memorial of justification by faith because it always points to Christ, never points to ourselves as a method of salvation. Uh, the Sabbath has never been, never been an instrument of, of salvation by ourselves. And uh, we've been accused of that. I, I shared with a couple of, last night a couple of experiences that I've had with uh, other pastors of other denominations. One was sour and the other one was good. The one was sour was when, when uh, the fellow tried to save me and uh, I gave him all the correct answers and he finally, he kept hammering away and finally, I mentioned last night, I thought to myself, I'm going to fix his little old wagon. And so I just started going into the Ten Commandments, back to the chapter, or, uh, the last verse of the Ten Commandments and started going up to the Seventh Commandment, that's where, where it stops. And I said, are you guilty of being unfaithful to your wife? And he just exploded. He screamed, he jumped out of the chair and said, let's get out of here. And then uh, the elder with him went off. And then I talked about another one about a pastor who, he and I were very good friends. And he asked me one time about, uh, he said, give me a study of justification by faith, which I did. And he was blown away that an Adventist would give him that kind of a study. And uh, I want to share another one with you tonight, the Presbyterian uh, pastor, who we're, we're very close friends. We, we worked together as much as we could. Uh, we had a difference, and that was over the Sabbath and Sunday. But it was not a knockdown, down drag out fight. <laughs> we expressed our positions. And he was, a, he was on the state level on uh, the Blue Laws. They'd been put out of, uh, almost out of existence. And, uh, but his group was going to the government to insist that they enforce the Sunday Blue Law. And I was opposed to it, but I was on the lower, lower level, uh, state, uh, you know, uh, city level, level. In fact, I sided with the Jews and the uh, liquor dealers. <laughs> the liquor dealers wanted to have, uh, they wanted to be open on Sunday. And I felt, I didn't believe in it drinking alcohol. I didn't believe they should be even selling it. But I believe they had a right to uh, be open on Sunday if, uh, if, as a business. Well, anyhow, my friend, he kept asking me to come worship with him some Sunday at his Presbyterian church. And I kept putting it off. And I really wasn't interested in going. But early one morning, the Lord laid on my heart that I needed to go to the Presbyterian church and uh, listen to this preacher. And so we did, Shirley and I went, and we were a little bit late. I don't like to be late for, when I, when I used to go to movies, if I was five minutes late, I would wait till the next one. <laughs> I didn't want to get in on it, when the was coming. So, but this day, we walked into Presbyterian Church, and the deacon walked us down the aisle. It was a long, a pretty big sized church. He walked us all the way down and put us on the front door. And at that time, this big, he was a big man, Great big mustache, long legs, he always smiling. He came out of his office and to the pulpit. His legs were pumping and he was looking around smiling. He looked over the congregation, he would like, he saw me, he said, Oh no! <laughs> he says, Of all times when the seventh Adventist pastor to be here is today. <laughs> then he looked at me, he said, <clears throat> We've been going through the Ten Commandments and we're on the Fourth Commandments today. <laughs> and I just smiled at him. And, I, I talked to him about, uh, uh, excuse me, yeah, sorry. Can you pull your computer this way? Just this way? Sure. Oh, sorry about that. There you go. All right. Just tapping on the mic. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> if I was beating the correct time, I'd be all right. <laughs> but anyhow, the, uh, uh, I have been talking to him about that uh, you cannot support any day by law. Well, I, I was hinting at that Sunday keeping by law is legal. But I never said it overtly, I just hinted at it. And I kept saying the Sabbath, we cannot, uh, we cannot support a law, a law to support Sabbath. And that, for man's law. And, uh, and that the Sabbath is a sign of righteousness by faith. And so the pastor, as he looked, got through looking at me, he looked very straight uh, to his congregation. The most serious I think I've ever seen him. And he said, well, I've got some news today. Uh, we lost the battle with the blue laws. <laughs> and 
And then he said, well, I guess we're going to have to accept Sunday by faith alone, just as the Adventists do by the Sabbath. <laughs> but uh, he, did, he never got what I had said before. You know, but I, I wasn't, it wasn't explicit, but it was always the implication of that sort of thing. And he was picking up, he was picking up most of it. And he told me one time, he said, Terry, I, I want to tell you where I get my sermons. At that time, they had these times out of a southern pub, and it's no longer in existence now, but uh, he, he said he, get, he got most of his sermons out of these times and out of Liberty Magazine. So, at, at, at the time that uh, we were friends, he, uh, the Northern Presbyterians were going through a horrendous struggle on homosexuality, mm -hmm. coming in as uh, preachers and that sort of thing. And he told me, he said, Jerry, if this thing, uh, well, in fact, we were, we were traveling together. He said, I've got to go to this meeting. He said, I wish you could come in with me. Because he was standing alone, and he knew that I was supporting him. There was no way they would let me in. And, uh, but he said, if, 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 if this passes, he said, I'm leaving the Northern uh, Presbyterian Church. I'm going to go south and uh, join the Southern Presbyterians, which he did. They, they voted, and, and uh, he, he packed up the that. But I'm hoping that... Uh, that those magazines are still working on him. Some of the conversations that we had, he was wonderful. He really was a wonderful man. One time he was sick with the flu, I think it was, and Shirley and I went over to his house, <laughs> and I was going to give him some hydrotherapy. And he just smiled. He was sick as a dog. He said, well, all things, the preacher comes <laughs> to give us some health, you know. So, but, uh, so I'm hoping that he'll be, that he'll, be in, uh, that he'll accept the message in the last days. But anyhow, the Sabbath is a sign of righteousness by faith. It always has been, and it always will be. And uh, now, also, the, the Psalm 119.45 says that, David says, I will walk at liberty. Why? Because I seek your precepts. So, and we, tell, we know in uh, James, talks about being judged by the law of liberty. And... Uh, so uh, the question that comes again, is the Sabbath included in the law of liberty? Absolutely. It's, it's a memorial, again, of the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, I don't know, I'm not always a Sabbath keeper, but I can assure you that when I accepted the Sabbath, my heart just overflowed. And uh, I could hardly wait for the Sabbath. From one Sabbath to the next, I wanted to be <laughs> I wanted to be with God's people on the Sabbath. A tremendous blessing. And uh, sometimes you become, become a preacher, and then you work hard to work harder on the Sabbath than you can the other day of the week. But that's all right, too. Anyhow, the, God's Ten Commandments, especially the Sabbath, are about righteousness and freedom for the believer. God's Ten Commandments, especially the Sabbath, are about righteousness and well, I to said that. There is only one kind of righteousness on the earth, and that is. Faith righteousness. God's righteousness is in heaven. We accept it by faith. We accept Christ by faith. And he brings his righteousness with us. And uh, this is, and the Sabbath then points to that righteousness that, that he gives to us in Christ. Now we cannot go to the law nor to the Sabbath to obtain righteousness. That's what the Pharisees did. And uh, it, it was not good enough. We can only get it by faith in Jesus Christ alone. No other way. And uh, God has promised to give it to us. And we come claiming His merits, His mercy, and what Christ has done for us. The righteousness of God comes to us apart from the Sabbath, but it also testifies, as I mentioned before, it testifies to if we have the genuine article. And last night, as we looked at uh, Revelation 9, uh, 14, 9, and 10, and, well, and 11, when it talks about the struggle that's going on, it's uh, liberty of conscience will be denied. Only verse 12, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They're the only ones who are going to be truly free and will be defending religious liberty, liberty of conscience. And, uh, but so there'll be, there'll be that struggle that's going on, but we need not fear because God has promised to be with us and he will fight our battles for us. It doesn't, doesn't mean we're not going to have any problems, but, uh, but God will be with us as he promised. And the time, uh, the faith of Jesus, we didn't touch on this last night, but a whole study on it, the 
Faith of Jesus is believing not only the absence of our feelings, but against them. And we see that at Calvary. Everything in his experience was saying, you don't have faith. You've lost it. And, but he continued to believe. In fact, the last, the last time he spoke out, uh, the forsake, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Faith spoke twice. And it spoke first when he said, my God, my God. And then, why have you forsaken me? That was his feeling. But uh, faith spoke first, it spoke twice. And Christ came through. That is the faith of Jesus. That's the faith that we receive when we come to him uh, and, and ask him. I want to take a look a little bit about uh, uh, Egypt and Sinai. Uh, on the bottom one here, it's the same. Oh, you can probably see that. Uh, the uh, mine's all green. <laughs> uh, this is the land of Goshen. It truly was the land of milk, milk and honey at that time. And God led them to Mount Sinai to give them the law. But uh, uh, coming back to what I said before, we cannot go to the law nor the Sabbath for liberty. Found in Christ alone. And uh, now, Scripture refers to Egypt as two, in two aspects. One is physical, and the other is spiritual. The children of Israel were, were, uh, were brought out of physical Egypt, but they refused to be delivered from spiritual Egypt. They constantly wanted, wanted to go back. It was because they did not want to be converted. That God had to send them in the wilderness for 40 years. And most of them died in the wilderness. But they refused the spiritual aspect of uh, being delivered from, from uh, Egypt. And I want to, uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, 24 and 12. Yeah. Uh, Revelation 11, 8, speaking about France, was named as spiritual Egypt and spiritual soul because this was the condition of France during the Re their reformation, the revolution. But I want to go to Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, we'll demonstrate that, that Egypt is, stands for sin spiritually. Um, in fact, I want to do something else too while we're thinking about it. Uh, and, uh, Let's go to chapter 10 first. We're going to come back to this, but I've got a new thought. And maybe I'm getting sidetracked, but I don't think so. Um, chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews. This is a good Advent uh, passage during the time of the disappointment, the tarrying time. And uh, in verse 35 it says, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. This is a message that James White especially used when people were discouraged. I remember reading one time, he came in, I don't know if it was a church, it may have been a home or a public building, and the people were deeply discouraged. And he came in and he was keeping time to music, the Bible. And by the time he reached the pulpit, everybody was singing <laughs> with him. But this is, this is one of the passages that he preached during the tarrying time. That was the, the time when, when the disappointment had come and Christ did not come, and then they, this was justification by faith to rely upon the Word of God. This comes from Habakkuk, chapter 2. And that was given probably 20, 20 or 30 years before the captivity of the Babylonians. And, uh, and then 10 years before that, uh, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, says, this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And then chapter 33, it's repeated except it changes the pronouns. It says, this is the name whereby she 
will be called the Lord, our righteousness. And this was given the same year, or within a year, before they went into captivity. So God was pulling out all stops to save Israel from going to Babylon through the message of justification by faith. And he was doing the same thing in the 1844 movement. And James White was in tune with that. Now, we're going to look at chapter 11, dealing with the liberty of conscience. We think of it sometimes as the faith chapter, which it is. But if you drop down to um, verse 32, here we're dealing with liberty of conscience. And this is the result of justification by faith. What shall we say then? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence and fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. The women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. This is dealing with liberty conscience. These people would rather die than give up the conscience. And so this follows directly from justification by faith. Faith. We, we read from Luther last night also that he said, I've been teaching um, liberty of conscience as the essence of faith. And uh, we'll probably get into more of that tomorrow. But I, I was impressed to read this tonight. But liberty of conscience always comes with justification by faith. It frees us to choose or to refuse. We can refuse Christ also. Now, let's go back to 20, um, 24 of chapter 11. This is dealing with Moses when he left Egypt. And even before he left Egypt, 24 says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked toward the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, and he endured it as seeing him who was invisible. So what we have here now, Noah had a tremendous advantage being raised in fear of cost, but well, advantage but also disadvantages. He would have been the next Pharaoh. He studied everything they had. And I would I would imagine he studied the uh, theology of the Pharaohs. Uh, he had to know that before he ever become Pharaoh. And, uh, but he, he refused the last steps of, of uh, bowing down to those gods and claiming himself to be a god. Because that's part of, that was part of also. But he studied medicine too, by the way. Uh, the Eber uh, papyri and some of those were in existence at his time. And he, would, he had to study. The Pharaohs were physicians as well as gods. <laughs> and, uh, and he would have been in that kind of position position, but he turned from it all. And this is the point here, that spiritual Egypt is, uh, uh, is yeah, did I pass on? For some reason, I don't know. Let me see if I can get it. Maybe it's, okay. <laughs> spiritual Egypt, uh, you have the affliction with the people of God and the reproach of Christ as being synonymous. And we have also the pleasure of sin. For some reason this is not kicking in. <clears throat> Here it is. Okay. Pleasure of sin and the treasures of Egypt are also synonymous. 
And so we put it like this, affliction and reproach are joined together. Sin and Egypt are joined together in this structure. Sin and Egypt are synonymous. Spiritual Egypt is the realm of sin. There's mud. Now let's go to uh, Exodus chapter 20 and uh, pick up <coughs> here. Exodus 20. In the first two verses. This is part of the Ten Commandments. Now, many times we look at the Ten Commandments and they begin with verse 3. Amen. But the Ten Commandments begin in verse 1. Amen. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Before they could keep the commandments of God, they had to be delivered. Yes. They were delivered from physical Egypt, but they were not delivered from spiritual Egypt. Remember, as they wandered, uh, before they went into the wilderness, actually, but all through the wilderness, did the same thing. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Whenever they ran into a trial, mm -hmm. well, if you think of the food they had, they didn't like God's vegetarian program. <laughs> What's this stuff? This manna. <laughs> they didn't like it. But there was other things they didn't like. And every time they got in the vine, they said, let's, let's uh, be a leader and have him make us, take us back to Egypt. They were in bondage, not only physically, but now they were in bondage spiritually, and they, they had no desire to be delivered from that. And I believe that's similar to what's happening today. Egypt is still around physically, and she's still around spiritually. And God wants to deliver us. We may not be in physical bondage, but He wants to deliver us spiritually. Now there's been a change in the country now we're dealing with Babylon. Physical Babylon has passed off the scene. But spiritual Babylon is still with us. The book of Revelation is dealing primarily with spiritual Babylon. And in contact with God's people. And God wants to deliver us completely from Babylonian theology, practices of all kinds. And he will have the people that will stand up to this regime. Uh, in written, especially as we talk about Revelation. In Exodus 20, as I mentioned earlier, this is part of the Ten Commandments. God is a mighty deliverer. And the law of God, then, being a demonstration and a proclamation of His righteousness, when that law is placed within us through Christ, the law becomes a testimony to it. We say we believe that God has delivered us from Egypt, from sin. And we may fall, we may stumble, but... We know who the Redeemer is. We turn to Him and say, God, I don't have the power. You must act as you promised you will. And He'll, he'll hear us. Amen. And time and time again, we run into these situations. And again, Israel was delivered from physical bondage, but refused to be delivered from spiritual bondage. He refused to give up sin. And as I mentioned, Babylon also has two aspects, physical and spiritual. Well, look at this physical person. Um, Cyrus Cylinder was written probably by one of his priests or penmen, and uh, in that he outlines the capture of Babylon. Babylon couldn't be, couldn't be defeated. It was impossible. Babylon had two walls around, uh, around the city. They had a moat in between. In fact, one of the walls was so wide that they could run chariot races on top of it. It was amazing. I heard some one time six six feet six wide, but I, I don't think it'd be that many, maybe four. <laughs> but uh, it was a tremendous. It could not be taken. They had enough food uh, to last for 20 years, and so all they would do is stand on the walls and laugh at people trying to. And they did that with, with uh, Cyrus uh, as he came up to the wall, and he, and Cyrus almost gave up in discouragement, but he remembered something. He remembered something that he had done the year before. Amen. And uh, you guys are committed to that? Yeah. All right. Uh, um, so here again, the cylinder had an inscription described. Eric, did you remind us what he did? What? Did you remind us what he did the year before? Yeah, I'm going to get into it. Okay. Okay. Thank uh, you. Uh, in that description, uh, 
uh, well, probably written by a priest of Marduk. And uh, here, the great theme of the seven cylinder inscription is that Cyrus is the chosen of Merodach, or Marduk, and that Merodach has given him the empire of Babylon. Now, this is from their standpoint. But it was judgment from God. And God gave two calls to his people to come out of Babylon. And they're found in Jeremiah. Let's, let's go to Jeremiah and read this. Uh, and we're going to see what happened, uh, what this was about. Chapter 51, verse 6. It says, lift up your eyes to the heavens. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in, I'm in Isaiah. Jeremiah. <coughs> Jeremiah 51. By the way, I, I got this from A.T. Jones years ago. Uh, verse 6. When I get there, he says, Flee from the midst of Babylon, and everyone save his life. Do not be caught off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. And uh, now we we'll go to chapter 51. Actually, we'll there, uh, verses 45 and 46. This is the first call. My people go out of the midst of her. Let everyone deliver himself from the fierce anger of the Lord. Lest your heart faint and you fear for the rumor that will be heard in the land. A rumor will come one year, and after that, another year, a rumor shall come. And violence in the land, rumor against rumor. And then in verse uh, 47, it talks about the judgment that God would bring upon Babylon. And here is a, uh, an account by uh, Herodotus, who was a Greek historian. He's, he's known as the father of history. And he collected materials systematically and put them together. And he's the first one that we, th that we think ever did this. And he wrote about Babylon and Medo-Persia and that group. And he would gather the material and he would test their accuracy as the best that he could and uh, arrange them uh, in well-structured and uh, vivid narrative. This is what he wrote. Cyrus on his way to Babylon came to the banks of the, sometimes it's called Gindis or I think it's gun days is what it, how it's pronounced. And here is a, a map of a very small river. But as Cyrus came up north from where he, he, was, root, root, he was ruling in, uh, among the Medes and Persians, and he had to go north and he hit this river and uh, something happened at the river. Um, again, this is the river. This is, here are the pictures of it. Uh, most of the time it's fairly uh, smooth. Here it's in a narrow place. It's a little rough. Here's one, again, more smooth. Here's one in flood time. And you see the young man riding on the back of a, a buffalo. Mm -hmm. You can see how deep it is. Well, Cyrus came to that river in flood time. And you're trying to think of how to cross it. And one of his uh, sacred white horses fell into the river and drowned. And he became furious. And he said, I'm going to make this river so low that a woman can walk across it without getting her skirts wet. <laughs> and so he divided his men. Somehow he got a group of them on the other side. And then uh, they, they, uh, channeled, they dug channels, 180 of them on each side of the river and drained it so that but it took them a year to do it, or nearly a year. And so the Jews heard about the rumor was that Cyrus is coming one year. And then it stopped. And then they heard it a second time. And that's when he was able to cross the river with his army, with his sacred white horses, and women who could go across without getting their skirts wet. And so then he, they marched on down to, uh, uh, to Babylon. I think this next one. Talks about, you know, okay. When Cyrus reached this stream, which could only be passed in boats, one of the sacred white horses accompanying his march fell, uh, full of spirit and high metal. 
walking in the water, trying to cross by himself. But the current seized him, swept him along, drowned him in its depths. Cyrus, enraged at the instance of the river, threatened so to break his strength that in the future even women should cross it easily without wetting their knees. <coughs> I said skirts, but <laughs> the knees. Accordingly, he put off for a time his attack on Babylon. Dividing his army into two parts, he marked out the ropes of 180 trenches on each side of the uh, gun deck, leading off from it in all directions and setting his army to dig, some on one side of the river, some on the other. He accomplished his threat by the aid of so great a number of hands, but not without losing thereby the whole summer season. Usually this, they fought during the summertime. In the wintertime, they would go home and, and uh, sharpen their knives. <laughs> Having, however, thus wreaked his vengeance on gun day by dispersing it through three 160 uh, channels, Cyrus, with the first approach of the ensuing spring, marched toward forward to Babylon again. And when he got to the city, uh, I think I've got a picture of oh, this. I've got this one out of war order. When he came to the city, he saw that, but he knew, he knew what the, what the uh, walls were like. He knew the territory very much. And, uh, and he almost gave up uh, in discouragement because the Babylonians were just mocking him. And uh, he didn't have, the, didn't have the power to get through. This wasn't invented at that time. <clears throat> and so, but he remembered, I'm going to go back to this one, I had out of order. He remembered what he did on the on that river where he lost that sacred white horse. And so he he knew there was a, a, a reservoir up res river from Babylon. And he sent his men to digging a channel from the river to and this means the Euphrates into that reservoir. And it took some time to do, but as they, they broke through, then he had men stationed on on either side of the walls of Babylon. Here's one we see them marching under the wall. Because as the water went down, they marched marched through. They probably got their knees wet as they went through. Then there was a the rest of the army was on the other side of the wall. The men went down, the water went down, they marched in and uh, met and captured Babylon almost without a shot. I'm sure there was a battle going on, but not not like it would have been. And that's the night that Belshazzar was drinking from the the vessels from the house of the Lord. And that was his last last day also on earth. But that's how uh, that's how ha that's what happened at that time. There are two rumors. Can you think of any other rumors that might happen to be relevant to us? Revelation. 14.8, and then also chapter 18, and that's the one we're facing with, yeah, 14.8 has already, has already taken place. Um, the, uh, verse 8, you're familiar with it, probably already there before me. And the message is, another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now that's not, it's not completely fulfilled yet. The first part, there was the beginning of the falling of, of Babylon. And this is spiritual Babylon. This is talking about apostate Protestantism that rejected the three angels' message in 1844, the sanctuary message of the Sabbath, Christ coming. Uh, probably in, in the spring of the, the uh, summer of 1844. And uh, then 18, in the fall of the year when Christ did not come, horrible this disappointment of God's people. And the people who made up Babylon really had a, a high day uh, ridiculing God's people. And I'm sure there were some of the people who responded later and, and uh, accepted the message, but not very many, just a little. But this message is going to come again. This is, that was the first rumor, 1844. The next one is, we don't have a time element. We know it's more than a year, because that year has gone past, even, even a uh, uh, prophetic year. But let's go to chapter 18. 
And uh, here we have, uh, beginning with verse 1, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. This is a picture of the loud cry, the mighty movement of God in the last days. We, began, we believe that that movement began in 1888. We're told uh, that uh, um, the latter rain had begun. The loud cry had begun in the presentation of Christ and his righteousness, justification by faith. That was about 1892. But it, it, it started spinning out. Um, and the reason for that was there was not, not enough people that accepted it. I remember a friend of mine, we, he called me up one time before a minister's meeting, and uh, I don't know if I said something or what, I don't remember even why the conversation got started, but I, I responded to him, and, uh, and I said, well, that message was rejected in 1888. He said, how, how can you say that? He, he, he railed on me for quite some time. And so when we got to the minister's meeting, he nailed me after the first meeting. <laughs> and, uh, and so we went for a long walk. No one so long, we went for a walk. He said, you, don't, you need to explain yourself. That the 1880 message was a loud cry. And I said, what's the purpose of the loud cry? And he, he knew what it was, that it was to prepare people for the Sunday law and also to prepare people for the second coming of Christ. And I said, did it happen? And he said, no. I said, that's your answer. He said, oh, well, that's simple. I said, yeah, it's that simple. <laughs> and, uh, today he's a believer, but it took him a while to, to believe. But, but that is, this is the message that God has given to you and to me to proclaim to the world. And it's the uplifting of Christ in such a powerful way. Joan said it only ten times the power. And Ellen White got that a little bit later on, thinking this. There's a power that we have not seen yet, but it's the power of godliness, not just intellectual presentations. In order to give this message, we must first, it must get a hold of us, heart and mind and soul, and it will go like wildfire. We're not there yet, but I think it's coming. Amen. Now, verse 2, this is the picture of Babylon. He cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of demons, a prison of every foul spirit a cage for every unclean and hated bird. What a picture of Christians who have turned away from God. The whole world will be involved in this. It's interesting, the word Babylon, or Babel, comes from two words, Babe, which is top, uh, either gate or passageway, and the last two letters are L. It means the, God, the gateway to heaven or the great gateway to God for salvation. That's what it meant originally. But because of the confusion at the Tower of Babel, the Jews said, well, this is nothing but confusion because of the experience they had at that time. So it's come down to us today as spiritual con uh, confusion. And uh, so it's both. It's still, they're talking about God, but they're confused and uh, mixing uh, some of the things we looked at uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, we're seeing some of that today. No, but this is a full-blown picture of spiritualism. And one of the things that spiritualism states that when they get into power, they're going to do away with the blood of Christ. And they're very strong on this. And, uh, and that's coming too. <laughs> uh, there are many people who do not believe that Christ died for us as part of redemption of paying our penalty that we deserve. There's some people who will not accept it. And, but anyhow, it's, it's going to come anyhow. Then in verse 3 it says, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And this is going on today. And, uh, but it's going to come to an end. Well, this is the whole world going to be involved in this, except God's we need to be among that people. <laughs> we cannot miss the boat on this one. Because there will be no probation after that. And uh, God, has, God has promised that he will keep us by his grace if we only let him. And then verse 4. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. So he has people in Babylon. 
and our work is to call them out. Amen. And so the question comes, uh, the, uh, the two rumors, Revelation 14, 8, and 18, 2. And he says, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive of her plagues. And so the question comes, which way? By what teaching? By what power? Jesus Christ says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the, I am the life. We need all. We need him as the way. We need the truth. We need his power of life within us. And so Christ stands asking us to come. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. The life of righteousness by faith. And now, here we come to uh, a leader sister, both Ellen White and, and A.T. Jones. Uh, this is what she had to say. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to enlighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of the 1840-44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world. And in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. And that is chapter 18 of the Revelation. And this is what A.T. Jones had to say. And, uh, when I first read this, I was really excited about it. I tried to find the quotation, couldn't find it. I thought, oh, well, I'll share with you what I, what I thought. Jones referred to the above passage in the Great Controversy. And in a sermon recorded in the General Conference Bulletin, 1893, and this is what he, he said then. Another testimony that has never been printed says that this will come as suddenly as it did in 44 and with 10 times the power. We've seen nothing yet of this kind of power. It's going to move everyone, either move toward us, Christ, toward, uh, move us toward Christ, or it's going to force us away from him. The power will not be accepted by many. But I read this, and I tried to find it, because he, clearly he's referring to Ellen White here. And I couldn't find it for years. And I thought, well, it's one of the apocryphal statements that <laughs> credit to Ellen White. But one day I was reading another book, uh, entitled The uh, Spalding Magan Collection, page 4. She wrote, I saw the latter rain was coming as suddenly as the midnight cry and with ten times the power. Amen. Want to be a part of that? <laughs> I do too. Not just, not just to have the power, but to see the power of God going it's like fire in a stone. It is coming. It's going to come. And here's a, a statement of, uh, I've used when I was teaching, I, I uh, always, I didn't have uh, students memorize, but I repeated it so much they began to memorize it. And this is one of them, infinite love has cast up a pathway upon which the ransom of the Lord may pass from earth to heaven. That path is the Son of God. Angel guides are sent to direct our erring feet. Heaven's glorious ladder is let down in every man's path. Barring his way to vice and folly, he must trample upon a crucified redeemer ere he can pass onward to a life of sin. Praise powerful, powerful. I remember one young man, highly talented, a good preacher, a good student, I thought. Oh, he was, he was a good student. Uh, maybe mostly by memorization, I don't know for sure. But he turned away from the Lord. And he'd been into drugs before, before I met him. And, uh, but he was off. He was off everything. And he took off from where we were at, and he went into, into the Boston area, and went back, went back to New Hampshire. And uh, he called me up. And I, I could tell something was wrong, but he wouldn't. I was, I was fishing, but I couldn't, I couldn't get him to speak entirely. And I said, well, where are you? And he said, you don't want to hear it. I said, yes, I do. I want to hear it. I said, I'll come and get you. He said, no, 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 you can't come. I said, where are you? He said, I'm in a beer joint. And uh, he was about half loaded probably by then. And 
I said, I'll come after you anyhow. No, I don't want you to come. And he went, I tell you, he went head over heels into sin that he had never gone into before. And then years later, he called me again. And he said, I want to tell you something. God has not left me alone from the time you said something to me. He said, this statement that I read to them, he had memorized it. He said, I could not get this out of my mind. <laughs> and so he said, you're going to stop trembling on Christ. And he came back to the dead. Amen. So these things are, are powerful. Uh, we, and this is the kind of power we need in our lives now. It's not, not a big exhibition of outward power. That's coming. But it must be in our lives now, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. He will give us all the power we need to overcome Egypt or sin. And uh, here, again, uh, Joan said this, salvation through sin certainly depends upon there being more power in grace than there is in sin. There's more power in, in uh, Christ's righteousness than Babylon or Egypt, our own lives, whatever it might be. And last night, uh, I was going to try to find out again, but I, I didn't find it. But um, the idea is that, that if you live through the time of trouble, you must know Jesus Christ. We may not know all the details of things that are going to happen, but if we know Jesus, we spend time with him, get to know him, he will direct us whenever we, we need direction. And so we don't, have, we don't have to worry about what's coming down the pike. If we focus on him day by day. And then here's another one. This is from uh, Mrs. White. Do not conclude that the upward path is the hard Amen. and the downward road the easy way. All along the road that leads to death, there are pains and penalties. There are sorrows and disappointments. Huh? And that's the end of it. Come back tomorrow and we'll show you. This is from Mount of Blessing. I think it's about page 18 of remember. Um, God's love has made it hard for the heedless and headstrong to destroy themselves. God's love, His power, His righteousness, His complete deliverer from Babylon, from Egypt, from our own sins, from the pet sins or inherited. But He is a mighty deliverer. Thank God for it. And He never, never gives up on us. And I think some of us, maybe everyone in this room, can testify to that fact. That, that he, he has great mercy. More than we deserve, but, deserve. but he wants, he can't stand the thought that anyone be lost. Not willing that a single person be lost. Day by day, as we get to learn him and his righteousness, his mercy, his goodness, his grace, it leads us to a deeper madness that leads us to a deeper madness. With that, probably that was so great. Father, we come again to your throne of grace. We thank you for the message that you've given to us in your word. And we pray that day by day, moment by moment, that we may get to know you better, understand what you are to us better, and understand good news that's better than anything we've ever heard before. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.